Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about season two, episode two, or sorry, episode three, Out Where the Buses Don't Run, a classic Miami Vice episode. One of the highest rated Miami Vice episodes ever. It originally premiered on, on October 18th, 1985. The writers for Joel Surnow, who we have seen a bunch already, Cool Running, Calderon's Return, Great McCarthy, Little Prince, he was also the showrunner until Dick Wolf took over, and Douglas Lloyd also helped write with this. This was his only episode that he wrote. The director was Jim Johnston, who also directed no- Nobody Lives Forever, and a couple episodes that are coming up. This was a great episode that I think caught both of us totally off guard because the middle gets kind of wishy-washy or it gets a little weird, I guess, because of it, Officer... It gets kind of wacky. Mm-hmm. You know, I guess is the best way to put it. It got a little cartoonish to the point where I almost called it at, at the end. Yeah, I mean, it, off the, the retired officer was so out there. He was so crazy that... It, it felt too comical, but then they bring it home really good at the end. Yeah, def- I definitely, the ending is really what sold me on the episode, what really made me uh, like the episode, because, and I'll talk about it more as we go through the breakdown, but, you know, I was on the fence for a lot, for a lot, large part of this episode of, man, this is too cartoony. Um, yeah, exactly. But everything kind of came around at the end, and kinda, you know, went from being a bad, uh, you know, I'm going to tear this episode up to, Oh, wow, you know, like, like good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Before we get started, I'd like to check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. And you can tell we're down a person right now. Unfortunately, in my house, from Christmas to today, where we're recording on January 2nd, we have had the a cold rip through the house and get everyone sick, but not all sick at the same time, like a day apart. So like my son is, he got it first. And so you can see like the stages of the cold in everyone inside of the house. And so Melissa's out sick right now. And it's just, you can see if you're like one of the later ones, you can see that's what I'm going to be like in three days. You know, when everyone that gets sick, I like to do like a murder uh, investigation style, try and figure out like, what was the common utensil they used <laughs> that got them all sick? You know, follow the path. So it was the boy first, then it transferred to her. <laughs> when you have kids, you never know what they decide to do. Like, for example, my son one time when he had strep throat decided to start using other people's toothbrushes while he was sick. Without telling anyone, he just started using the wrong toothbrushes for some reason. That's a fantastic <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get over and begin our breakdown of this episode. All right, John. So although we're down a person this week, we have a lot to talk about. And in particular, with this opening, this opening is very, very strong. and It is strong for two reasons. One, it's pretty interesting. And two, it is flamboyantly Miami Vice. Because we start off with oh, a, yeah. a roller skater working his way through the park. In short shorts and a crop top, listening yeah, to Bob O'Reilly. Who loves short shorts? Because <laughs> it's like the first five people you see in the episode, aside from Little Richard, are wearing the shortest shorts I've ever seen. I've never seen so many male butt cheeks sticking at the bottom of shorts in my life until I saw the opening to this episode, which makes me think like yeah. it, it has and nothing like the to two do guys with that, like the two guys co- like that like were like. What they pop out of the bush or something? <laughs> it's like more short shorts, you know. It's like they're just appearing everywhere. It was even worse because they had their they had like their sleeveless shirts on and they had them tucked into the short shorts, like almost to the point where you could see the shirt sticking out the bottom of the shorts. There were so many sh- uh, guys in short shorts that Crockett and Tubbs almost didn't even notice the girl <laughs> walking her dog in the <laughs> bikini uh, along the car. <laughs> yeah, I just I just imagine like them. I mean, the mid '80s was a weird time, but I imagine driving around like, what the fuck's going on around here? The gentleman uh. skating down through the park, his name is Manuel. He also goes by the name Skates, which I have to say, you're not a viable city unless you have one of those guys that roller skates around, dancing in front of cars along one of the major roads. I don't take you seriously as a city if you don't have one of those guys. You've lived in too many big cities. <laughs> so Manuel, uh. he. He so, gets flagged down by by a couple of other guys who who are like just waving their hands around. Drugs here, 
bring the drugs over here. And at the same time, yeah, we, and, and yeah, I was going to say, like, at the same time, we get little Richard right off the bat. I don't know, it, like, preaching up a storm. He's like preaching out of the back of a car, it kind of looks like. And he's then gives out cups to people who are there l- listening to him preach to go solicit donations. So in reality, we, we all know what it is. Like, go beg for money in this park, please. I was actually kind of let down that this is all the little Richard that we got. Me too. I was expecting like, oh, Oh, there, there he is. They're introducing them right away. Like we're gonna get a whole bunch of little Richard, and then nothing. I was just, uh, and I think that's what really started me off. And on a sour note with this episode was like, I was like, well, wait a minute, is that is that it? Like we're not even gonna. He's not like the main guy. Yeah, they like barely even use him. He's just there to introduce the person who brings down skates, and then that's it. That's it. I guess it's just trying to add some Miami and- flavor. Maybe I guess you know, but I mean, Ving Rhames wasn't a big name when he was on the show, and so you understood why he his wasn't the biggest part. Mm-hmm. But Richard was still was little Richard when Miami Vice rolled around. He had been famous long before Miami Vice. Oh yeah, Tutti Fruity came out in the oh. mid fifties, so at this point, he has been a yeah. pop culture icon for thirty years. So. Um, the, the question I was, I was asking by the end of the, uh, because we don't see him again was like, did they just not want to pay for him to be in the whole episode? Like, <laughs> or not know, pay for his You know music. how in Sweep Sweeps, uh, well, you know how like some shows in Sweep Sweeps still have all these guest stars. You know, that might be what's happening here because if you think about, in the prodigal son and what whatever works if you think about the guest stars that we've gotten that might be what this is now we call them guest stars like Penn Jillette he really hadn't been in anything both the, the guest stars in this episode sorry not Bruce McGill Bruce McGill was already popular yeah but David straight there this was his first appearance in on on anything was in this show so maybe we're looking at it through a different lens because this would be a celebrity reach, even though he's not very in the episode very much. We're just looking back now at all the celebrities that have been in the first two episodes of this season and who are celebrities now, but they weren't back then. So yeah, what's, yeah. what's what's really happening here, though, is that Tubbs and Crockett are in the Ferrari, which got fixed up real fast, I might add. Remember, last week it was totally trashed, but they got that thing cleaned up real fast. They're tailing skates oh, to yeah. go see where he's going to make his deal. And yeah, and Crockett's been a little paranoid. He's He's got this weird feeling. Yeah, and we see someone taking pictures, and he pops up, and it's like, you ever get that feeling I could be in watch? And, and this is a great line from Tubbs. He's, Tubbs is like, nah, we because Crockett asks, like, hey, uh, d- does does anyone know that, that we're doing this? Does skates find Is there a way that skates c- could have found out? Is that why we're being watched? I have this feeling like I'm being watched. And Tubbs is like, no, man, we're good at this. No one knows that we would be here. And I had a good five-minute laugh at Tubbs thinking that they're good Uh at being undercover. (laughs) Yes, yeah. We're good at this. It always works out when we park right next to where, right across the street from what's, uh, where the stink is. Yeah, exactly. We've had no issues. So you think but, Trump would, uh, you think Tubbs would be the last one to think that considering the last time he parked outside of thing operation, the uh, <laughs> guys beat the heck out of him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He parked in the same spot after they had been noticed before. Yeah, so it, they're not so good at this. <laughs> yeah. So eventually they do see. Manuel going in to make the sale, so they come to bust him, and Manuel grabs one of the women who was uh, out begging for money for for the preacher. He grabs her to take her hostage, but she whips around and hits him right in the face with her Bible and takes him down fast. I guess that's one of the perils of selling drugs on roller skates. Would that be considered a Bible thumper? <laughs> I, don't, I, I, I don't own a drum set. Sorry, guys. <laughs> And then a- after they make a bus, we go to our opening credits. When we come back from the credits, we're at the precinct and the duo say they have nothing on skates. He was just making that one deal, but they have no connection. I don't really know why they were following him to begin with because in comes walking in comes Hank Weldon. Hank Weldon is a retired vice cop and he just walks right past everyone in the building, right into a meeting with Tubbs, Crockett, and Castillo. And what's great too is that he comes in and, and right off the bat, you get that. That there's something off about this guy, you know, and the way he talks to almost talks down to Crockett and Tubbs, mm-hmm. it, you know, it, it had a very, he had a very Cliff Clavin like feeling like yeah. he knew everything. 
Yeah, exactly. It was it, uh, okay. Thank you. I, I thought I was the only one, only one that was going to have have that opinion. But he kind of had Cliff Clavin like it, he does. That's the way his mannerisms are. He's really over the top. He, you see people in the precinct just pointing at him as he just walks right by him. He comes in. He throws some p- pictures down. We see that he was the guy that Crockett had that feeling like someone was watching him. He had a picture of skates. He had a picture of Crockett and Tubbs in the car, and then Castillo, man. Crockett, Crockett remembers him. He Hank introduces himself. Crockett's like, "Yeah, I heard about you. I heard about you when I was coming up." And then Castillo, man, he just stares him down. And Hank throws on that like, "Put her there, pal," and kind of winks at him and makes like a funny voice. He leaves his hand out there, and this is like a good forty-five seconds. Castillo just stares at him until he finally shakes his hand. Yeah, dude, I just, I, I don't know. Like, I don't know if Castillo's like. Being serious, at, like, because he just does it so often. Does he really not like him, or is this just Castillo being Castillo? <laughs> yeah, this is this is his handshake. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Basically, all we get here is we get the the introduction to Hank Weldon. He says he has he can help them out with information. He says that th- that Cas- that skates works for a man named Costanza. And Costanza works for Tony Arcaro. That's who they really want. And you just see the look of shock on everyone's face. Like, who is this guy? He seems like he's a little off. Why would he just walk in here like this? And But he has all of the right information. That's the hard part. You can see, like, in Tubbs and Crockett's face, they're, like, looking at Castillo, like, don't make us work with a nut job. <laughs> but you can see, like, everyone's... Ha- but But he's, like, processing it, like... Because, I mean... You're right. All of his information kind of checks out. And um, it checks out later, too, because we stay at the precinct. Weldon leaves, and then Crockett and the B team are meeting in a separate room, and they're reviewing some so, some of the information from Skates and some of the information they got from Weldon. Crockett mentions that Weldon wants to take him around and show them the history of cocaine in Miami. Unfortunately, this is like the only time we see Trudy. Trudy comes in and says that she has the cassette tape that they asked for. And they say, go ahead and put it in the VCR and then leave. And so that's, and that's all the Trudy we get. But hey, we get a Trudy episode oh, next week. Not only is that the only Trudy, but my favorite Gina scene is right around here where she comes up and uh, hands a file to uh, Sonny. You know, proving she makes a fantastic secretary. <laughs> uh, so, and I'm pretty sure that's that's the most we get of her. We get a, we do get a little bit of the girls in a quick scene at the end in, in, mm-hmm. during the firefight, but they're just kind of there. Yeah, they don't that's say true. anything. That's true, and and that's a totally different topic on that when they bust down Tony oh, Arcaro. Yeah. When they oh, think they yeah. can bust down Tony Arcaro, we're gonna get to that. This scene at the precinct, though, we hear from Zito that he says that Freddie Costanza and Ray Pinchata have been pumping like fifteen to twenty keys into the jurisdiction a week, but they haven't been able to track either of them down. That's when the tape starts playing, and the tape is an old Miami newscast where it eventually comes to the story of Tony Arcaro, where he had been arrested, he served three years in jail, then he was released on a technicality and has a video of our car leaving jail it's clearly from years ago so all of this stuff checks out now Costanza and Pinchada are pumping drugs into their area. Zito and Switek have been trying to run them down. They all, they both work for Tony Arcaro and Tony was released from jail on a technicality and disappeared. No one has seen him again. So all of this stuff is playing right into Hank Weldon's court. The only thing that causes any kind of suspicion or any kind of doubt on this is that you see like so, uh, Sonny and Castillo talk about it in one of the scenes. They basically, they had the impression that, that Tony Acaro sleeps with the fishes, basically. <laughs> that, yeah. that they all thought, because he just fell off the map, he disappeared. They all thought that he just took a ride and never came back, yep. basically. Yep. So, and that's the only thing that throws any doubt onto the information that we're we're learning. So at the end of this scene, we see that Crockett and Tubbs leave the room. They tell Zito's wife to keep digging through all the files. Crockett is very nervous about working, doing anything with Hank. He doesn't trust him. He seems like he's he's off. And at this point, Crockett keeps saying like one-liners too. He keeps make, make, making jokes about how crazy Weldon is. He says like he's out where the buses don't run or he says the man left the most of his groceries at the market. I like, keep coming up with new ways to say he's just crazy and I don't know if I should trust him. Tubbs is like, hey, mm-hmm. we should just go out with him and see, see what kind of information he's got. And that's when Gina comes in with the file and we learned that hank had a partner and 
Marty Lang, and they're going to go talk to him. So they decide they're going to go out with Hank Weldon tonight. Then they're going to go see Mar- Marty Lang first thing in the morning. So, and Bruce McGillis, the guy that plays Hank Weldon, if you're listening, you would know him from movies like The Last Boy Scout, My Cousin Vinny, he played the sheriff in that. Some of All Fears... And Collateral, which is a Michael Mann film. Yeah, he's kind of like the grizzled cop, right? That's kind of his role that he's that he's done. The only one that's an exception yeah, to that yeah. is when he was in Animal House as the crazy motorcycle guy. So, but otherwise, so, he's but yeah, always other than that, that, pretty much just plays he, the grizzled cop. He's got the cop mustache, and he has <laughs> kept that mustache throughout his whole career. <laughs> yeah. So Tubbs and Crockett go out to meet Hank. And when we come to them that night, they happen to be leaving a club called Booty. And I have to say, I hope that is a real club in Miami because I hope to go to Booty someday. <laughs> yes. Yes. So this is when uh, Hank Wilden first got on my nerves because he starts to do this thing where he, every other sentence he does in an impression where he keeps doing like this Cuban impression and yeah um, then he does like some Clint Eastwood stuff or he'll do like Bugs Bunny style accent or something like that yeah and very quickly I just wanted someone to punch him (laughs) because <laughs> yeah. I was really like, like, just what the hell, you know, just say it. <laughs> yeah. Tubbs and Crockett are not happy with him because they thought they were going to go see Costanza and they, he took them to go see Pinchata. But Weldon is able to talk his way out of it when he says Costanza is trying to take, has taken over for our Carl. Pinchata wants Costanza dead and so does our Carl. And our Carl likes to make public hits. And what he learned tonight was is that Pinchata is going to make a hit on Costanza at a lunch, at a luncheon at the ocean club the next day it's funny as crazy as weldon is he is a thousand times better cop than crockett and tub oh yeah like yeah. he's doing all this in his spare time yeah Ooh, it, you guys get paid to do this <laughs> he's got a ton of information he puts stuff together really fast and from this scene we learn he is out of his damn mind yeah he is cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. And yeah. yet he is, he has deduced where this assassination is going to occur, who the major players are, and exactly what time they need to be there to stop it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the next morning, we have a brief yeah. stopover over a Sonny's boat. Tubbs is coming to pick him up. I'm only going to mention it because one of my favorite lines, one of my favorite moments from this episode is Sonny yelling at Elvis to stop chewing up his clothes. That is pretty good. My, <laughs> one of my favorite parts, though, is is the conversation between Tubbs and Crockett when they when he comes to pick him up? Tubbs asks Crockett if he uh, if he had a freaky dream about Weldon. <laughs> yeah, too. <laughs> I forgot. Yeah. So, and I'm thinking like weird, freaky, nasty dream. Like, <laughs> what kind of dreams are we having? Well, Tubbs and Crockett are off to go see Marty Lang, who now works at a federal desk job instead of being a vice cop but so they go up to see his office and immediately marty starts acting really weird they look at some crockett looks at a picture on the wall where hank's in the picture and marty goes over there immediately and takes it down he clearly does not want to talk about hank crockett starts pushing on it and he says like hey hank's file shows he's got a lot of accolades and awards gets a lot of praise he quit the vice in 79 and marty's like what do you mean quit he left he was forced to leave under psychiatric care yeah so and like this scene like it had kind of a lethal weapon vibe starting it Uh, and i think part of that was the scenery him behind that big desk in that office Mm -hmm. jan hammer's just he needs to tone down the drama music a little bit man (laughs) it's like the like dramatic like background music really kicked up during this scene like everything that his former partner was saying was like like Dun, dun, dun. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It is an important scene because we, because Marty lets it out that Hank has been going after our Carl his whole career. And when he was totally obsessed with bringing down our Carl, and then when he was released from jail, he just lost his mind. Get a lot of background on Weldon here as well. Like we learned his whole backstory as far as his wife leaving, changing mm-hmm. her name. Mm-hmm. You know, we find out that Hank Weldon is basically a character from a country song. <laughs> yeah. He also didn't believe, because the, the official ruling on our car was that, or the feeling is, is that Costanza had him killed. And Marty says that his, Hank never believed that. He still believes that our car was out there somewhere. When they mm-hmm. leave from the office, of course, who's sitting on the hood of Tubbs' car? 
but Hank. Because, you know, he's a good cop. On lemonade. (laughs) Dude, he drinks clam juice. Who? That's right. Clam Who juice. drinks clam juice? You that should have been a warning sign I right don't away. No, I didn't even know clam juice was available. <laughs> Tubbs and Crockett try to tell Hank, like, hey, get off the car, beat it. We're real cops. Go back to your house. And Hank snaps. He just he takes his bottle of clam juice and he slams it on the ground and he's like, I guess you don't need me. I'm just gonna go home and go curl up into a ball. He just flips out as soon as they tell him to get lost and so they just let him into the car instead of having to deal with them then we have this really weird scene and it, it, it's a great scene not weird as in our normal Miami Vice like I don't know why this is here it's a weird scene as in you see how crazy Hank is he's sitting up on the back seat so he's out the convertible he's singing and I fought the law his shirt's unbuttoned most of the way and you see Tubbs and Crockett's face like I can't believe this guy is in this car and he's doing this right now. I'm telling you, it wasn't, it, it can't be clam juice. It's got it. He's drunk, <laughs> clearly drunk. <laughs> I'm pretty sure uh, we're coming up on where we get to meet his beautiful wife and computer, Lorraine. Yes. Yeah. So they're on their way over to Hank's place. And when they get there, it's obviously, it's a dump. He lives in like, what it's like an old warehouse that he's converted into a series of rooms. It's not even locked. And then he, they go past his bed into a secret room and in there is his computer that he has named Lorraine. Which I'm pretty sure if I, it, cause I was trying to figure this out without going, uh, having to go back, but I'm pretty sure that's what his partner said his wife's name was that left him. You know, that's a good question. I wasn't paying attention to that. That's a Yeah, I'm pretty I'm sure he named sure. his computer after his wife. Oh, interesting. Interesting. That's just more like just how crazy he is. And of course, on the computer, yeah. the only or thing ex-wife. on the computer is all of his information about the Akaro gang. And he has put a lot of work into how it's labeled, how you search for it. Like he's kind of a computer genius for the mid eighties. Yeah, pretty much. You know, he's got this whole MS thing figured out. <laughs> well, and go, when they're going through the series of pictures, Tubbs re- recognizes one of the people as Bernie Wingo, wh- who had, there's just an APB put out or a warrant put out for him. He's been hanging out with Pinchada lately. Hank can't really remember who Wingo is. And we have this weird scene where he has these, fl- where you see these flashbacks in Hank's head of the day when our Carl was released from jail. And then he finally remembers like, oh, yeah, that's right. Wingo disappeared when our Carl disappeared. Yeah. And so, and the whole time, all of this is happening. He's still doing the impressions. Yes. So, I mean, at, at this point in the episode, I want to strangle him. <laughs> well, he loses his shit for a few minutes. He like goes off and it's like, I want our car and I'm going to bring him down. He starts yelling. Then he immediately goes back to doing the, the weird accents and the impersonations, the impressions and stuff where he, he begs them to go to lunch. That way they can go see Costanza get hit. And of course, on their way out as the, as the duo agree to go take Hank over to the ocean club so they can go affirm that Costanza is not going to get shot, that, that Hank is out of his mind, which Hank, again ends up being right chubb steals the floppy disk uh-huh. out of the lorraine computer and it was just a gigantic floppy disk i mean it had to have had i don't know four megabytes of storage i mean it was huge yeah which, <laughs> which honestly we all know just means more work for gina and trudy <laughs> <laughs> so they do a goddamn thing with that. <laughs> so, but let's go watch them. Uh, let's go watch Colonel Sanders get shot. <laughs> so they they head straight over to the Ocean Club, and when we first come in, Hank is busy telling the waiter that Tubbs is an acclaimed food critic, has been published in over three hundred newspapers, and he doesn't like that table. What's great in this episode is the look on Crockett and Tubbs' face the entire episode. They are cringing so bad so often that it almost feels like they're actually cringing and not acting yeah like they're like oh my god this is gonna kill our show (laughs) did you hear him do the cuban accent oh my god (laughs) well crockett starts telling hey like hey there's no one named costanza on the reservation list you're at like this thing that you think is going to happen you're out of your mind you're you're crazy i do want to point out this they are crack cops crockett and tubs Oh, his name is not on the list. The fugitive's name is not on the list. (laughs) Therefore, he cannot be showing up here. And of course, the, the, right the after, crazy guy, the real cop, he figured it out. Yeah, yeah, because Hank says, like, when you're Costanza, when you're a mob boss like this, you don't have to make a reservation. You can get seated right away. And of course, when he says that, 
in come Costanza and three other gangsters to come sit down at a table. So, and then immediately after that, Hank's like, and I bet you the shooter's going to be in just a few minutes. And in comes Colonel Sanders. Actually, I, I said he yes. kind of looked like, if you've ever seen the movie Dallas Buyers Club, he looked a lot like Matthew McConaughey as a cowboy. Yeah, yeah, very true, very true. Yeah, but I, I, I just, I, I saw the ca- the like hat and the, like the white boots, and I was like, I, oh my God, it's Colonel Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Colonel Sanders, Sanders, who's actually... Damn, El Polo ch- Loco. <laughs> I'll teach you to open a church's chicken in my neighborhood. <laughs> immigrants took all took all my chicken. Dogs. <laughs> of course, Colonel Sanders just walks straight up to Costanza and shoots him right in the forehead, and then just walks right out. Walks out into the hallway. Thompson Crockett give chase. They corner. They get him at the door. There's a short shootout, and in true vice fashion, they don't wound anyone. They never take prisoners. It's shoot to kill. Shoot only. to kill. <laughs> yes. Shoot to kill. Less paperwork. <laughs> They've got this pop thing figured out. Speeding ticket? Nope. Shoot to kill. <laughs> then you don't have to fill out any paperwork. Take yeah, your I mean, gun. You're off for a few days. <laughs> Which, by the way, you notice how they never do that uh, no. in, in oh, this no. show. Like, normally, like, anytime a cop discharges his weapon in real life, um, they do a full report and the cop doesn't get his gun back until they clear the shooting. The amount of times that they have sh- just gone off and just f- uh, shooting and killing people, they should be uh, like on on suspension or on leave or oh, like, yeah. have to be ha- have to see the union shrink or something. I mean, they, <laughs> in season, we're at the beginning of season two and they've already killed at least 50 people. We know that there isn't, first of all, we know that there isn't a shrink because in the last and in whatever works, they were unable to sell the Ferrari to get the shrink. So the vice team just had to take one for Crockett because he wanted to keep his Ferrari. Yeah. The second part of that is that if they didn't do it after they killed that entire small town in Glades, they're never going to do it for <laughs> anyone. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. So, I mean, it, it ends up being Wait, Wingo. And you would By think the way, that they I do would want to ask I, him questions. Uh, I, I do want to throw something out there. I did make a note, non, non-episode non related, but show related. Why can't the bad guy be named Smith? <laughs> uh, okay? I am having a hell of a time spelling these names. <laughs> Why can't we have a Don Smith episode? <laughs> At the end of this, after they shoot and kill Wingo, Hank is just behind him like, see, I told you. But they have to arrest Hank now because it's just so suspicious that he knows everything that's going to happen. So they, of course, arrest him and take him back down to the precinct, which is when, when we get there, we see Thompson Crockett having a meeting with Castillo. So is this the meeting where it starts out with Crockett and Stan and Stan plugs in the projector or something? I don't know. I, I think so. I think this is it because that would be next in my notes. Okay. Yeah. So, so okay. So the scene this I've noticed with Miami Vice before they do a serious part in the scene, they'll do a little like slapstick comedy thing, you know, mm-hmm. like you know, like make a joke and then to the serious. Mm-hmm. Um, and this scene kind of starts that way. Like Crockett comes walking into the room, set uh, him and uh, Stan. He makes says something to Stan, makes a joker shot at Stan. And Stan plugs in the plug, and the plug, like, sparks. Oh, And then yeah. Stan just leaves, and then the scene gets all serious, but there's, like, this little, like, joke at the beginning of the scene, like, womp, womp, you know? Like, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, that's Swipe Stan, got, you got, know? He got electrocuted. Ha ha. Yeah. Like, oh, we just keep him around to plug shit in. <laughs> <laughs> The important part of this scene is that Castillo is saying, look, look, he's been right every time. We have to kind of go with what he says. And Crockett says he thinks he's got some way to patch into the vice computers or he's got someone that's feeding him information. Castillo says, look, we're going to release him. He's been right the entire time. We're just going to monitor him. And then Tubbs takes the floppy disk of from Lorraine and then puts it into the computer to go see what he can find out from the Lorraine computer. And of course it's rigged and Hank knew that they would take it because again, Hank is a really good cop. He totally rigged it because he knew that they would try and investigate his computer. Yeah, like I said, he, he's definitely got to be, you know, he's up there with the Bill Gates, you know. I mean, <laughs> this is 1985, and that's pretty impressive. Yeah, I, exactly. You know, it's 2016. I couldn't do that. No, <laughs> no, no, of, co- of course. Like, 
And this is on... He's a vice cop. He's a former vice cop, not a computer programmer. We have a brief stopover at Crockett's boat where Hank is staying. And he's telling Crockett while he was on the inside, while he was in jail after they arrested him, he talked to someone named Stiltsy O'Brien. And this is a great conversation because he's like, I talked to Stiltsy. And Crockett's like, you talked to Stiltsy? And Tubbs is like, what does Stiltsy have to say? He's like, who the fuck Stiltsy? Why does everyone else know him? We don't know who the hell this guy is. Everybody Stiltsy, don't you know Stiltsy, Dominic? I mean, oh my God. <laughs> Stiltsy is like the most popular drug dealer. He, you know, he hangs out over there. <laughs> this is the point in the episode where I'm like, this is just getting, this is just so cartoonish. that I, 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 I'm like, it's going to, watch, it's going to have uh, this cartoon, this Scooby-Doo ending mm-hmm. where it's going to be like, it's going to turn out that Weldon was a car all along. You know, like you almost expect them, like I'm almost expecting them to like grab and pull off his mask. Yeah. You know, like yeah, it's exactly. a car. What have <laughs> got away with it? And it the fake stomach. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I just jokingly wrote on my notes if Wilden turns out to be a car in disguise, I'll quit the podcast. <laughs> Then as the episode so let's to move the end on here, yeah, because that starts to get a little start to get a little nervous about that. Hank says that when he talked to Stiltsy, that Stiltsy had a big time lawyer and he needed to get out that day because he had a big deal coming down the next day. Tubbs and Crockett go racing back to Castillo late night meeting. They're the only ones at the precinct. And he tells them like, look, they they have this information about Stiltsy. There's gonna be a deal going down. It, it's it, it's nap time at the station. <laughs> Everyone's it, it, it's nap time. Everyone's uh, taking their naps, and then they're gonna have snack time, and then they get back to work. <laughs> well, this is gonna be yeah, a big Steel bus. A tight ship. <laughs> well, this is gonna be a big bus. It's gonna take a lot of people to be involved in this bus, so they're obviously worried because Hank has been so outlandish, but he's been right every single time so castillo says let's go for it let's let's get it set up and let's and let's make this bust so then we head the next morning out to the stakeout is it weird hold on before we leave that scene is it weird that what bothers me the most sometimes about this show is that they smoke inside state and federal buildings oh john i know I know weird? you as a smoker, like you just watch these things and go like, those were the good days. Those are the days where you could l- literally smoke anywhere. No one's bothered by it. None of the, no one like, ah, <laughs> I just, it's, I, I know it shouldn't, but it just bothers me watching it, watching Crockett sitting there smoking it or holding a cigarette. Mm-hmm. I don't think I ever, he ever actually smokes it. Just the it's fact that he's allowed to light up that now cigarette. Now you can't even smoke it outside <laughs> uh, so the next morning at the stakeout they're at i don't know what these boat houses are they almost look like they're they're houses that you could rent they're out in the ocean you go take your boat out to it and then there's like a little boat house that you could park it in then appear that's for each one of the houses the vice team is all set up at one and then they're watching this other one zeno and switek are there they're real skeptical about this whole thing they're even sharing their food it, it's it's Anytime you see them, they look a little like Jesus. (laughs) Yeah. Zito has a strong Jesus look going on. They're up there in the house with all the vice, all the vice team members are there. And then Crockett and Tubbs and Hank are down in the speedboat hidden inside of the boathouse. And they're just waiting for the steel to go down. We wait a few minutes. Nothing's happened. Then, of course, a couple boats pull up and a plane lands and they start pulling drugs out of the plane and putting them into the boat. So, again, Hank was right. He was dead right on what was going to happen. Yeah, and and by the way, that is one of the longest stakeout scenes we've had so far because they just go back and forth and back and forth and banter while we're waiting for them to come with the boat, you know. And up to and at this point in the episode, I'm I'm starting to hope that the dock house explodes now. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. fuck it, just blow it up. <laughs> I just want to see something explode now. <laughs> it's a really weird bust. Someone do something. It's a really weird bust too because. Cassio gives the ghost signal, and then Hank, Crockett, and Tubbs come busting out of the speedboat and go racing over there, and you get to see the distance. The place that they're staking out is like a mile away. You can barely see it from their house. Yeah. And they just get on the bullhorn like, yeah, so stop, a, a Miami, few notes Miami from the Vice. Bus. So, so a few of my notes uh, or critiques as far as the busts go, they need boat sirens. First off, <laughs> because right now they're just speedboats racing toward a dock house. Like, hey, how the fuck am I going to know? <laughs> also, why are Dana and Trudy dressed salt and pepper? 
Um, did you see their outfits? No, it wasn't painted. They're like, it, like, oh my god, they're they're like hot pink shorts and with like the hat. God, they, they just, must have been taken advantage I mean, of the time like, out of the house. Like, are they undercover for this stakeout? Or <laughs> I was just, I was so floored at how far so, and, away uh, they um, were. And then, dude, and then like during the shooting, there's the guy who's leaning out shooting and Castillo's kind of just hovering over him, like almost like just drinking his coffee. <laughs> you know, he's not doing anything. He's just kind of watching. You know, he's got the guy. It's just so weird. Castillo strikes me that he's the same all the time, right? So in the morning, it's like he's over someone's shoulder just drinking coffee, staring down at the shootout. In the morning when he gets up to get ready for work, he's like standing in his kitchen, no pants on, just a, a just a butt, j- j- just a button up shirt and a tie, drinking coffee, sitting out the window with no pants on. Uh, uh-huh. dude, he's a he's a Lumberg from Office <laughs> Space. <laughs> the shootout too. It's like, how is there a shootout? These bullets from these guns cannot travel that distance. You're like shooting into Cuba. <laughs> That's how far away this house is. Mm-mm. So, uh-huh. but they do take down like half of them. The other half give up. And they pull up on the boat and Hank just starts yelling, Akaro, Akaro. And he searches all the people and Akaro's not there. And so Hank had like placed all of his, he had gone all in that this deal is where Akaro was going to be. And none of them are Akaro. And he just, he gets upstairs and he yells out like, what am I going to tell Lorraine? He is a nut job. Yeah. He's just totally losing. It is. Yeah. He's a complete nut job. And a borderline liability for these guys. I yeah. mean, they keep letting them pal around with them. You know, palling around with them is one thing during the investigation. This is a full shootout. He's clearly not the same cop he was before. I don't know. And the next scene gets even weirder because we go back to the precinct and Castillo is just sitting at his desk doing like a serenity now. He's got his eyes closed. He's spinning around in his chair a little bit. He's rubbing the te- his his temples. Like, I can't believe what just happened. I mean, things. Yeah, I, I don't I don't understand why anyone is upset, first of all. They, they made a gigantic bust of cocaine coming off of an airplane and brought down a lot of people on this bust. Yeah, okay, they didn't get our car, but they still... Hank is the only one that thinks our car was still alive, right? Castillo gets a phone call, and it's Weldon, and the conversation goes from, like, hey, buddy, what you doing? <laughs> to, like, crazy ex-girlfriend, don't leave me or I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why is he calling Castillo? Out of all, out of the three of them, I figured Castillo's the one that liked him the least. I figured, like, he would call Crockett or Tubbs, but no, he calls Castillo? Yeah. I, I don't know. It gets really weird, but it's fitting for everything that that is Hank. Of course, the duo go, they drive over to Hank's place to go see if he's there. They go in and they see that he's destroyed his computer. So we go back to the precinct. Tubbs and Crockett are just hanging out with Castillo. They're all really worried about Hank. They don't know what he's going to do, where he's gone. He's obviously a liability now because things didn't work out. He's a total nut job, so who knows what it's at, what he's going to actually do. Mm-hmm. And then Switek comes in and says, hey, you hanks on the phone and hank says i have our caro come out and get him i'm at this address on water street come get a caro he's ready to go the duo says we're out of here they go jump in the ferrari to go get him and castillo says they tell castillo to call for backup he says no i know who to call and he ends up calling marty which we find out in this last scene of of the episode yeah we have a brief and, and, driving and montage basically one the address he gave him was like one two three fake street <laughs> yeah um, yeah it's like one two three water you know, street the driving scene Crockett and tubbs going to meet up with him i'm tempted to move to my just for the lack of traffic <laughs> i mean the traffic yeah. here in washington's terrible and like he's driving there's like no one on the road he's just yeah. cruising and i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure it's the same driving montage that was in lombard when al partner tried to kill him and then Sonny shoots and kills him from on top of the overpass so let's get to this last so scene this because is this episode, is where it brings it all home yeah this is where it gets interesting from what i was saying earlier yeah so tubs of crockett come pulling up it is a building but it's super run down it's it they pick up a sign they're at the right place but the building is falling down they come walking up really slowly the tone in this is great the music is great. The tone is great. I'm totally sucked into this last scene because Hank is out of his mind. So who yeah. knows what he's planning there? I'm thinking this is suicide by cop because he was wrong, because he had devoted all of his life to trying to bring, bring down our car. He finally had all the dominoes fall into, into the right place. 
and then it ended up not being able to bring down Arcaro. I think he's luring okay. Tubbs and Crockett there so that they will kill him. Okay. So let me tell you where I'm at in this episode. I just jokingly was saying, like, I really hope uh, it feels like they're going down a Scooby-Doo ending here. And up until this point, it, it's we've been getting more and more serious. But I'm still scared of that Scooby-Doo ending. And uh-huh. I'm seriously starting to wonder, like, I, you know, I made that comment. Like, if if he turns out to be a Caro, you know, like, I'm going to quit the podcast. And I'm like, <laughs> it, and they come in, the top Tubbs and Crockett come in, and they follow him into the other room. And he keeps saying, like, like, don't you see him? He's right there uh, uh-huh. about a car. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, I was right. Yeah, <laughs> a car. And I'm thinking, like, oh, my God, I'm going to have to quit the podcast. <laughs> like, they, they just totally scooby dooed me, you know? So I'm super sucked in. And yeah, thankfully. And, and Hank is just nailing it. He's being real creepy. He's, like, sulking around in these dark hallways in this abandoned building. Tubbs and Crockett have their guns out. They come into the room, and Hank's like, here he is. I miranda him already. He's re- he's ready for you to take him in. And there's no one in there but Hank. Yeah, so I'm I'm seriously worried. Like, oh, my God. He is he is a car. And then he starts. He picks up, like, a pipe or something yeah. and starts pounding the wall. And there's the dead body in the wall gets yeah. exposed. And I'm like, oh, thank God. You know? <laughs> Yeah, um, he, he uses that pipe and he breaks off the drywall. And inside of the drywall is our Carl's body. It's clearly our Carl's body. He's got the white suit on, got the hat on. Crockett reaches in and pulls out what is in our Carl's hand. And in there is the paper from the video when he was released from jail. So our Caro didn't even make it. He was released from jail and he was killed that day. Yeah, yeah. Which I thought was on the nose for it to be the newspaper but I'll, I'll let that slide I'll let that slide because that it was at this point in the episode where it all starts clicking like okay he killed Akaro yeah. after he got out of prison and put him in the wall yeah and and like that's when it you know the the serious and like he's he he's just gone nuts after that after that all went down and and everything and yeah. just the the tone of the room with everyone just kind of standing there and, and this is when his uh marty his partner shows up and everyone's kind of just looking at at the body on the wall and looking at henry and it's just like you see the you see how much sympathy they have for him yeah you know even for there's marty. also this yeah even for marty yeah, they have but there's yeah who actually and Marty, who actually gets to helping cover it up, up the murder. Yeah. You know, and, and there's almost this look on, on their face, like, what the, what do we do now? Exactly. And this is another one of those moments where I'll get into my final thoughts that Vice does so well. It's like, what happens to police officers when they're not police officers? And this whole time, mm-hmm. Hank has been, he was obsessed with bringing our Caro down. And he snapped when... A Carl got off on a technicality. He went and killed him. Marty helped cover it up. He helped him build the wall to put to put the body in the wall. And then uh Henry Hank just lost his mind after that to try and he was trying to cover up like his a coping me- mechanism for him to pretend like it didn't happen. Almost like a shutter island where he just a Carl's still out there. He has to go try and find him because that's the only way he can cope is still trying to find our Carl. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and then like when you think back to when they first met Marty and he's talking about the backstory for Henry and everything he went through, you can kind of, when you think about it now, knowing that he killed a Caro after he got out of prison and you look at like his whole life fell apart after that. He fell apart mentally. His wife left him, changed their name, everything, his whole world just came crumbling down because he just couldn't handle that this guy was going to walk, that he had put so much time into investigating that, that snap decision, you know, you have to imagine it would be more of an emotional reaction where he kills a Carl. It's very powerful. That changed my mind about the episode. You know, it, yeah. I went from worrying it was going to be Scooby-Doo to actually appreciating the levity. Of exactly. You know, well, let's, let's save some of that for our final thoughts on this episode. There were a couple songs in this hidden Hidden deep in this in this episode. So let's go over there and talk about the music. All right, John, what do you got for us this week? Okay, so we only had two songs, so it's going to be a shorter music segment. We started the episode off with Baba O'Reilly by The Who 
on the album Who's Next? Uh, I'm assuming the pun was intended. <laughs> so, and I'm going to say this, and I don't care how many people hate me for it. Probably best known as the theme song for CSI New York. <laughs> I don't know. It was a pretty don't popular me, song. <laughs> <laughs> so it came out in 1971. It was written by Pete Townsend. Even though Roger Daltrey sings pretty much the entire song, except for the middle part where Pete Townsend, that little speaking part in the middle, uh-huh. that that's Pete Townsend. But the rest of it, he made Roger Daltrey sing. Um, <laughs> and Roger he has that kind of power over beginning. him. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. He's been riding Pete Townsend's coattails for too many years. I mean, he was in free. That's something, right? <laughs> uh, I'm not making any friends right now. Uh, <laughs> so the title actually named after Tua Townsend's philosophical and musical influences in Meher Baba and Terry O'Reilly. Uh, I'm sorry, Terry Riley. Not there's no O. I made him Irish for some reason, <laughs> and I'm not a hundred percent sure who that those two people are. So, yeah. but they are his musical influences. And that's why it was named that. It was originally written for his uh, Lifehouse, uh, Peter Townsend's Lifehouse project, which was going to be a, a rock opera. Mm. So, so it's it would have like, been it would have been part of like what, when they did Quadrophenia. Yeah, so actually, this is actually something the Who was really famous for. This is they. This would have been their second rock opera because they had already previously released Tommy. The next one was supposed to be Lifehouse, but it, they ended up scrapping it. But they stole nine songs off of the what they were going to use for the project and put it on the the album, mm. um, which was a good idea because it was a huge album. And Bob O'Reilly is one of the biggest songs, one of the most iconic songs that the, the Who ever released. It originally wasn't going to be on an, on a Who album, but they, they just used it. And originally, it was going to be 30 minutes long, but they ended up cutting it down to five minutes. If that song was 30 minutes. Uh, I know. No, I mean, it's great as it stands. I can't imagine it being any longer, though. Although, I say that, though, and so. I really, really love Shine On You Crazy Diamond by Pink Floyd. And if you put all of those songs together at the beginning and the end for, for that album, it's like 27 minutes long. So That's a very good point. I Actually, I, I love that song, too, from Pink Floyd. So and The last thing I'll say about Baba O'Reilly, it is the official theme song of competitor competitive eater Joey Chestnut. <laughs> so bringing all the celebrities out. <laughs> the second, the last song in the episode is Brothers in Arms by Dire Straits off their 85 albums, the same name. Brothers in Arms. Arms. Yes, which I've talked about a lot on This Week in Vice because that's where Money for Nothing was released as well. Yeah, yeah. and it was number one album worldwide when it was released. It, it It's one of the best-selling albums of all time, selling over 30 million copies. And it was actually Dire Straits' final album until they reunited in 1991 to record from 85 to 91, a six-year gap. I guess they just kind of felt like, I don't know how we topped this. They put a heck of a lot of work into the album itself. They went out and got this uh, producer who they had heard on a few different tracks. Actually, I'm looking. I can't find his name right now. I think the reason the album was such a big album is they took a chance and they featured a vibraphonist named Mike Maneri. So Mike Maneri, obviously, he, he's got to be the key factor in this because he's worked with guys like Buddy Rich, West Montgomery, Jerry Stieg, you know. So I think that's what pushed him over the edge was the, the, the fine work of Mike Maneri on the vi- vibraphone that just made all those other songs so, so, so fantastic. Mike Maneri being married to the famous harpist, E. Karstensen. <laughs> For an episode that seemed like it was a little slow, I expected there to be more music, but you're right. I mean, they, they didn't really put anything in the middle there. It's just in the very beginning and the very end. And even in the very beginning when they play Bob O'Reilly, it's not much of it. And we're so distracted by all the butt cheeks hanging out the bottom of shorts, you don't really notice the song that's playing. Uh-huh. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, this episode just wasn't... The, the music was just not the important part of this episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I could have gone on and talked more about Dire Straits. We've already featured Dire Straits before, and I, I am positive we will be featuring them again oh yeah and so 
trying to find some of these some of these music segments is just trying to find new and interesting things to talk about the same band <laughs> true so true let's get over and wrap up this episode and talk about our final thoughts so I'll, ki- I'll kick off this week for the final thoughts. What I found interesting about this episode is that, yeah, it dragged on a little bit in the middle. Hank was was really over the top and being crazy. I, I guess I'm with you, John. I wish that would have been toned down a little bit to maybe maybe make you question if he's crazy or not. But he was just so overtly insane. I guess it worked because it kept you on edge because you never knew exactly what just, was going to happen. He just kept being right. The, the problem I have with this is I wanted them to show him being insane, but I didn't want it to be laughable. Mm-hmm. I didn't want it to be wacky and, and like, yep. uh, like it almost felt like it was, they were trying to make it comical. Yeah. It's like I wanted it to be more like that was the time where I wanted it to be more serious. And that, that's what I talk about with a lot of times vice with the serious stuff. They try and include this very, they try and include humor in it. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it helps the show, like some of the stuff they've done with the B team, like it lightens the mood and stuff, mm-hmm. helps the show move along. But uh, sometimes it just takes away some of the seriousness you mm-hmm. know, or some of the point of what they're going for. I guess for me, when we finally got to the end of the episode and I put together what was happening with Hank, is that what Miami Vice does really well is it, is it does it shows Crockett that it puts his face in a mirror. And that's what I love about the, the show and what they do with Crockett's character that they constantly bring up and remind Crockett, like they just pick up a mirror and make him look at himself. And that's what this is about with Hank is that th- he can easily see how any vice cop could end up here. And that's why when we get to the end of the episode, that there's a lot of empathy for Hank when they get there because they all have that person. We already have that person for Tubbs, right? In Calderon with 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 Calderon. Tubbs was obsessed with Calderon. That just happened to work out for him that they were able to bring down justice, but they had to go to another country. They had to jump through so many hoops. It was a big deal. It was amazing that none of, that none of them went mm-hmm. to jail bringing down Calderon. So what I love about Miami Vice is that they constantly make, they hold up a mirror to Crockett's face and it's like, do you want to end up like this? And he has to question why he's a vice cop. Does he want to keep doing it and how he's going to continue to do bus when he knows that that this might be his future. I really liked it. It's not my favorite episode, though. This episode is consistently ranked as being the best episode of Miami Vice. And right now, it's in my top five, maybe in my top three. It's probably number three for me as far as best episode. But it was it was really good, but I don't think it's as it's not the penultimate or the greatest episode ever of Miami Vice. Not yet. We still have a long way to go, but it was still pretty good. But I really do appreciate that when they stop and make they address what it's like to be a police officer. John, what are your final thoughts? Well, you know, I, I, I'm with you on that. I, I just one of the things I have to appreciate about Miami Vice is they they really go out of their way to try and talk about serious stuff and try and tackle serious issues sometimes. Not just with, with, you know, this is where you might end up, Sonny, but just going down the road of the whole mental health. This guy's clearly got an issue. It it, it just shows you how great the showrunners were kind of going through some of the harder issues. I know a lot of people who've grown up watching a lot of the Law & Order stuff, uh, like they think that that was the show really pushed the limits as far as talking about stuff that was really going on and issues, you know, one of them being like mental health and, Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But you know, it was shows like Miami Vice that really drove that before, and especially with Dick Wolf having taking over Miami Vice before doing Law and Order. Mm-hmm. Like, like there was a even even before Dick Wolf, there was a presence there of Miami Vice kind of pushing um, yeah. cop shows in that general di- direction. You know, and I mean, really before these type of shows, most cop shows were dragnet. They were procedural, not mm-hmm. as they didn't tackle drugs or prostitution or mm-hmm. or mental health or any of this type of stuff you know and so i just i, I just like the way that miami vice did it with this episode too you know I'll just yeah I think and, you know that's something that if i it wasn't for the first half of the episode if it wasn't for the first half of the episode being as fair and just kind of the over the top impressions and stuff this probably would have been one, one of my top three episodes but i i think 
Yen made up for a lot, and it would probably still be in my top six, probably just outside that top five, though. Yeah, and you know, that's something that I totally miss, and that would be unique for Miami Vice, is like what you were saying, is that addressing mental health, and they do a good job in this episode of people where they, they didn't know what to do with Hank, and so they just ignored him, and it wasn't until he finally had some people listen to him, they took yeah. him more seriously, but... It's like true for mental health where he was having me- mental health problems. And so everyone's decision was like, well, let's just ignore him because we don't know how to take care of him. Yeah. The whole episode, he's clearly got issues. And they're, they're I mean, as much as like, yeah, the info was helpful and stuff. The whole episode, they're basically just patronizing him rather than stating the obvious. Like, man, you have an issue. We need to get you help. Yeah. Exactly. Instead, they just keep patronizing them. Like, oh, he's fine. He'll be fine. He's just a little, he's just a little out there it's by the end of the episode you realize like you can't ignore it he's this man needs help you know and that that's i appreciate that because you don't you, you didn't get a lot of that especially in the 80s where people even acknowledged in hollywood mental health or things like that mm-hmm. all the characters were very characters were always very healthy as yeah. far as that that stuff because they didn't want to that rabbit hole you know yeah and they were trying to hide so. me- me- mental health issues behind being a transvestite or transsexual or being gay, you know, they try and hide those like, oh, that explains why they're that way. But in this case, it just shows him being crazy. So, yeah, I mean, because he's just another vice cop, just like they are. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed the show. This was season two, episode three, Out Where the Buses Don't Run. As you can tell, we had a good time with this episode. We, there were some things that we really loved from it. So we hope you enjoyed it too. We'd love to hear your feedback. You can email us, goalwiththeheat at gmail.com. Let us know what you think. Go check out the website, goalwiththeheat.com. You can find all the ways to subscribe, including our YouTube channel, Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play, however you choose to listen to the show. You can find all the ways to do that. You can also find the ways to contact us. You can get us both on twitter you have some thoughts about our show or about the this episode of my advice we'd love to hear your feedback get us on twitter that's gonna do it for us this week we'll see y'all next time bye pals